Advocate Busi Siwe Mkwebane cannot return to her offices just yet following her High Court victory. This is the Constitutional Court needs to confirm the Western Cape High Court ruling declaring her suspension invalid. Mkwebane was sent suspended by President Ramaphosa in June and a parliamentary inquiry into her fitness to hold office is underway. Benedict Peary is a legal analyst and joins me now. Benedict, good afternoon and welcome to you. There's a lot of discussion, obviously, about this decision yesterday. It's not a good look for the president. His decision was hurried, appeared retaliatory, and tainted by bias of a certain kind. Uh, just before we get into it deeper, what are your thoughts on these developments? Yeah, I think, you know, the judgment of the court um, is well-reasoned and a good one. Um, you, you know, I think uh, certainly it seems like um, the Parapara investigation became the president's Waterloo because there weren't any issues with respect to uh, the CR-17, Bosasa investigations and a host of other investigations that the public protector was investigating the president for. Uh, you know, where the wheels came off for the president uh, was immediately when the public protector announced that she would be investigating him and sent him a list of questions. Uh, and, you know, to the court, uh, his decision to then immediately suspend her following that uh, appeared to then be uh, one that um, had a bearing on that process, that investigation process. And therefore, the court found that, uh, you know, there was definitely a reasonable apprehension of bias given uh, the sequence of events and what appeared to be a knee-jerk reaction by the president. And I think there is a second piece that's quite important here uh, that relates to Section 96 of the Constitution, because the court also finding not only a reasonable apprehension of bias with respect to the exercise of the decision to suspend the public protector, but that actually the president was conflicted. Uh, his private interests relating to his business interests which he was being investigated for under the executive ethics code uh, in this particular instance would have conflicted with yeah. his official duties as the president. So I think those two are, 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 you know, are quite important findings by the court and naturally they have to be confirmed by the constitutional court because they go to the president's um, compliance with his constitutional obligations. I was going to get to that later, but let's go there right now. Isn't it quite serious for a sitting president to be found to be out of step with the law? Remember, we said a lot about it when Zuma was found guilty of violating the Constitution around the Nkandla matter. How executive power is exercised must at all times be in line with the Constitution. And the president is meant to be the strongest custodian, if not exemplar of it. Is, is, is that true? Would you, would you agree with that? It is very serious, and I think, you you know, there's a passage in the judgment itself where uh, the court speaks to that and says uh, this is actually an incidence of the rule of law, uh, which is obviously a cornerstone of our constitutional democracy. Um, and it's important that people who take decisions, such as the suspension of the head of a Chapter 9 institution, to not take those decisions on a whim or on a flimsy basis. I think those were the words that were actually used by the court. Uh, so... Obviously, if it looks like the reason for the decision was simply because there was an investigation pending or that had been commenced uh, and not for any other reason, for instance, uh, to protect the institution of the public protector or her office, which uh, is a more rational reason than uh, simply just being investigated. Um, yeah. That is a serious uh, finding by the court in that particular respect, particularly the president who uh, has to actually give effect to the Constitution, perhaps more so than anybody else. Benedict, the President has got the best legal minds at his disposal. Is it possible that this route would have been discussed and cautioned against? It certainly is possible. Um, you know, we heard the arguments in court, uh, and the, the biggest argument that the President raised was that, you know, that power that he had uh, was triggered simply by uh, the proceedings of the Section 194 committee commencing, um, you know. But what the court then found was actually that was a misdirected argument. So, yes, it, it did seem a, a bit uh, seductive at the point in time. But actually, the real question is what happened on the 9th of June when the president decided to suspend Busisiwe uh, Mkwebane. Uh, and in that respect, uh, the court didn't understand why a suspension was made a day before a decision was pending on the very question on the lawfulness of the suspension uh, and in such a hurried fashion. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that really sort of speaks to that in that particular way. <clears throat>
Right. Well, look, as we, we've said in the introduction, I think you might have mentioned as well, there has to be confirmation from the Constitutional Court because it relates to constitutional validity. How do you foresee that process? Is it a rubber stamp process or is it likely to be more complicated? It's certainly not a rubber stamp process. Um, so I think first it will be up to the public protector to enroll the matter with the Constitutional Court as expeditiously as, expeditiously as possible. Um, and and we, we're going to hear a rehearing of the arguments, uh, particularly around the issue of whether a reasonable apprehension of bias uh, is a disqualifying factor when a, the president exercises his ability to, or his power, to suspend the head of a Chapter 9 institution. I think we're going to get more arguments and more detailed arguments than we heard in the Western Cape High Court. Uh, certainly the question of Section 96 um, and the conflict of interest will be ventilated further as well. Uh, so it won't be a rubber stamp. I, I expect robust arguments in that respect because they speak to uh, very important points of the Constitution. Benedict, uh, just a quick one around um, the impact to the, uh, the office and the description of... Um, you know, of the autonomy of the uh, Chapter 9 institution like the public protector. What, what, what problems might you be foreseeing in terms of who influences, you know, what, what, what authorities emanate from or reach into that office? Um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand the question. Let but, me rephrase you know, then. Yeah. What I mean is you have the Western Cape High Court decision now, which is obviously making a reflection on what the president has done. All of this has the public protector's office at the center of it. It's a contested space. Is there likely to be any adverse ramifications on either the act itself or the way the office is allowed to, to operate? Uh, I would hope there aren't any negative ramifications. And uh, there's a paragraph in the judgment which I particularly took a liking to, uh, which speaks of the centrality and the crucialness of the public protector's office, uh, you know, given uh, uh, the, the difficulties with access to justice in this country and, and the costs that are related and how important the public protector's office is to adjudicating, uh, uh, you know, excesses in, in, in public power or governance. Uh, on behalf of the public. Uh, and for that reason, I think, you know, that institution deserves constitutional protection. Uh, and we've heard uh, or seen many judgments from the Constitutional Court, which speaks to how important it is an in, as an institution. And certainly, I expect that, you know, when this matter does go up to the Constitutional Court for confirmation, uh, the, its position and its centrality within our Constitution will actually be reaffirmed in this context. Um, I'm out of time, but I really do want to sneak this last one in. Your thoughts about the picture beyond the legal and into the strategic. We heard from evidence in the Section 194 inquiry, former CEO Basani Beloy expressing worry about the public protector's investigation into the president around that alleged Bosasa campaign donation. And then, you know, refer to this text that advocate Mkwebani purportedly sent about having to play a game of chess. Now, her impression was that a political game was being played. As you see these developments uh, and read them together, do, does, does that image fit in for you somehow? I think what we've heard in the Section 194 inquiry is, is, is definitely concerning. Uh, you know, the, the, the office of the public protector is not intended uh, to be playing political games or fact favoring certain political factions within the ruling party uh, and vice versa. So the evidence that has emanated, uh, you know, around the conduct of Busisiwe Mkwebana in particular uh, is really concerning. And I think it is correct that there is a Section 194 inquiry because, uh, you know, her conduct and her ability to uh, be the public protector with what is required in that office, uh, I think really may not stand up to scrutiny. Uh, I would hope that whoever uh, succeeds her uh, at whatever point in time can restore the integrity of that office, uh, you know, and, and run it in a manner that uh, is befitting of the office. Well, it seems like the game is, is longer than, than some might have anticipated. Thank you for your insights, Benedict. Really do appreciate that, Benedict uh, Analyst, uh, Benedict Peary, our legal analyst this evening.